Welcome to the Green Hub Dialogues. Through these conversations, we hope to connect the world of science and research and communicate some of the key priorities and understanding to the rest of us lay people. COVID-19 has paralyzed the world as we know it. The virus and the pandemic has affected every human life in some way or the other. In the conversation today, we hope to understand a little more about the pathogen transmission pathways, not just in science, but in the way it affects day-to-day -day human lives. We are very happy to have with us Dr. Abhi Tamim Vanak. An animal ecologist and conservation biologist, Dr. Vanak is a Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance Program Fellow and Senior Fellow and Convener for the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation at ATRI, Bangalore. His current work focuses on the ecology and conservation of India's semi arid savanna grasslands, and he is known for his research towards the elimination of rabies in India. The conservation of species, landscapes, and biodiversity drives his research interests. One of the key aspects of Dr. Vanak's work is that he focuses not only on conservation in natural systems, but also in human modified and human dominated landscapes. So thank you so much for joining us today, Abhi. First thing that we'd like to know from you is what made you shift from functioning as a wildlife biologist and in more natural uh, based systems to more human dominated landscapes? What was that shift? So my journey as a wildlife scientist started off uh, much like many others, you know, very interested with, in understanding animals, this great passion for the outdoors. After my undergraduate uh, degree uh, in, in Chennai, where I spent more time uh, on the beaches of Chennai looking for olive tree turtles than in classrooms, uh, I went to the Wildlife Institute of India to do my master's. And, uh, you know, my training at the Wildlife Institute of India was a very traditional wildlife conservation training where uh, it was almost ingrained in you that wildlife means uh, animals in natural systems and uh, the only way you could have these uh, large intact ecosystems with lots of wildlife in them was that if you remove people from there. During my PhD, I found that, you know, there's so much wildlife completely outside the protected area network and this, this wildlife existing in these fairly human modified and human dominated landscapes. Uh, and I started to explore more along the lines of how do animals adapt to human presence? Globally, when people talk about conservation, they hold up India as an example saying, oh, you know, people are so tolerant of wildlife. We still have so much wildlife, despite having the second highest population densities. So, you know, why, why are we losing that model? We already have that. That's something that should be nurtured, especially in India, which has a really long history of human presence and by constantly uh, pushing this model of fortress conservation forward uh, it's actually going to have a, ne a net negative effect on conservation in India. It's actually our large-scale incursion you know the large-scale destruction large-scale commercial activities that threaten entire ecosystems that are actually a huge problem for conservation. Without people, there would be no conservation success in India. We have to learn how to continue to coexist uh, with wildlife in such ecosystems. Uh, and that's the direction that my research has taken over the last 15 years or so. You have uh, worked a lot on rabies and other zoonotic viruses that cross over to humans and affect human lives. Uh, in the context of COVID, could you explain a little more about what these pathogen transmissions are? What are these pathogen pathways? Look, we are always surrounded by animals uh, and we are susceptible to many of the pathogens that these animals carry. Uh, there are several routes that uh, zoonotic pathogens can emerge uh, into humans. So for instance, you could have a direct pathway where uh, the animal either, you know, through a bite, for example, with, with rabies, or it could be airborne, or it could, buy, could be via a, a vector, such as a tick or a mosquito or a flea or one of those kinds of... Uh, when it, you know, the most common and probably the most dangerous is the aerosol route, uh, such as COVID-19. Um, and, you know, the possibility of that spreading 
quickly and fast through human networks becomes quite high. You know, COVID-19 uh, was bound to happen. Uh, we've had several signs that humans are susceptible to such a virus. Okay, for example, SARS uh, and then MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory, Respiratory Syndrome virus that emerged. These are all coronaviruses that came from bats. Uh, we've been warned about it for quite a few uh, few years. It's not it's not something that surprised many most scientists. If you now again consider humans as part of a natural cycle, humans are going to be affected by various kinds of pathogens. Rabies, which is one of the oldest known zoonoses, uh, we have very effective vaccines to prevent humans getting rabies, uh, and yet. More than 20,000 people die of rabies every year in India alone. What is new in the, in, uh, in the face of or in the context of COVID is how rapidly this has spread okay, and how it has gone, uh, how it has very quickly uh, attained a pandemic status and essentially shut down the world's economy. How much of this pathogen transmissions are actually linked to wild species and how threatened are humans uh, by this whole idea of zoonosis? There's a group of diseases called emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, of which 65% of them are zoonosis. Okay, or more than 65% are zoonosis. And of these, more than 70% come from wildlife. Okay? So certainly, wide variety of pathogens coming from wildlife is real, but it's often human action that precipitates this transmission pathway. Once the pathogen has spilled over to humans, and then you have again human to human transmission happening, okay? such as in the case of COVID-19, that's when real problems start for us. Now, when we end up disrupting natural cycles or natural chains of transmission, either through uh, you know, deforestation or um, or through capture of these animals and we bring them into uh, the, the live trade, particularly the live trade, and then they're kept in really unhygienic conditions uh, where then animals, you know, of different species um, intermingle. Then the chances of these viruses spilling over from one species to another species increases. Okay. Um, and the rates of mutation also increase. And that's when the risk of emergence to humans is also the highest. Okay? But it's still not going to happen through just a one-off contact. It often requires a repeated or prolonged duration of ex exposure. Uh, for example, these um, so-called wet markets have been now highlighted as one of the main risk factors. Uh, but that's not necessarily the only way we can get exposed to it. Our large-scale commercial animal production systems are also quite susceptible uh, to these kinds of viruses emerging or, or these pathogens emerging. For example, is avian flu. Uh, swine flu is another example. Uh, so it's not fair to only blame the eating habits of certain groups of people. You know, all of us are equally culpable in this in terms of uh, in terms of contributing the, to the risk of the emergence of these kinds of pathogens. Many of these zoonoses tend to be uh, more rampant in tropical and resource poor countries and uh, areas, geographical areas. This time it has swept across actually more affluent, resource rich, even temperate. Uh, uh, is there anything that you uh, feel that there is a reason that this is why it's happened? Um, so, you know, COVID-19 has, has really um, brought to the fore the dangers of the globalized economy that we live in. Um, you know, globalization has been touted as being this panacea for all our problems that, you know, if we live in a globalized world, so therefore capitalism and this economic system will help us eradicate po poverty, will improve our lifestyles and so on. But what it also does is... Um, it makes the risks, local risks, it, it can take a, a local risk factor and make it globalized in, in an instant. Usually, when we talk about health systems and we talk about diseases affecting poor countries or poor people or the most marginalized, uh, we somehow tend to blame them 
for the risk that they put themselves at. This time, the opposite has happened. This time, it's actually the more well-to-do, the affluent, who are the ones who are, res- who are the most responsible for the, the spread of this, the emergence and the spread of this disease. Once it got out, then it just, the richest countries with, with the highest uh, networks of air travel were the ones who received the highest number of cases. And fortunately, the price being paid by poor people who had very little to do with this disease and the spread of this disease, the after effects are now being felt by the most vulnerable people. And India is a classic example, you know, where our migrant laborers and so on are really facing the brunt of the problem for something they have nothing to do with. And, and in this time, like if you look at the pathogen pathway that you discussed earlier, the transmission pattern, I mean, rather than a pathway, it's been like a freeway this time. So is this mm-hmm. indicative of uh, zoonosis and future disease outbreaks? Do you feel that this is a new norm in the way infections pan out? It, it doesn't take too much to understand for people who are, you know, for epidemiologists and virologists and so on, who are, who are trying to understand these emergence patterns. They can see that uh, viruses that have a certain property um, that occur in certain kinds of hosts and which in certain situations can mutate rapidly. Okay? And then once, once they jump over to humans, then they have a tendency to spread quickly from, you, from human to human via an aerosol route. You, you know, once you have those conditions right, then you can predict very easily that this is going to happen. Okay? And why those specific regions? Why South China or Southeast Asia? Because they found that these are the areas where there's a lot of wildlife trade going on. Okay, you have uh, there's a high demand for wild meat, uh, fueled fueled by you know the economic boom that's happened in these regions over the last couple of decades. Chains tend to break or disrupt. The levels of interaction between humans and these host species increase then the chances of us getting exposed to these pathogens also increases. Uh, and therefore, the chance of a, of a new zoonosis or a deadly new deadly virus or some other pathogen emerging is quite high. Nat- natural scientists like yourself, you feel that worse pandemics and more complex pandemics or uh, emergence of disease could be on the way if we don't protect nature and preserve some of the natural systems where humans can coexist quite healthily with the balance. Uh, can you help us understand in the COVID context, how it is important, why is it important to maintain forest cover and keep some of these uh, natural systems safe? So, you know, there's a, there's a hypothesis, it's called the biodiversity dilution effect that posits that if the, the more intact the ecosystem, the more diverse the number of animals in those ecosystems, then the less chance of the risk of emergence of pathogens or viruses from those hosts to humans, um, even if there's a high diversity of pathogens themselves. Okay, so that itself is a really good argument for us. I mean, for years we've been hearing that you know we should save the rainforest because it might hold a cure for cancer, for instance. Now we are finally also waking up to the fact that we need to save these ecosystems because they can also unleash some pretty deadly diseases upon us if we don't, okay? If we continue on, the, on this path of sort of rapid, uh, blind economic growth, okay, which, which just sort of ignores the state of the natural world around us, then the world will come back to its knees again. Uh, there's another interesting hypothesis that says that, you know, the more intact populations of bats there are, uh, the less the risk of emergence of a virus from those populations. Okay. Because uh, large populations tend to buffer down the risk of a huge outbreak of these out- viruses within the bat population itself. Um, and especially if they're well connected, then there are always a pool of immune individuals in there. So there's the chance for a large outbreak of any pathogen, any virus occurring in any one population of bats is always low. You know, worldwide now, groups of scientists are now on a mission of discovery. They want to try and understand this virus sphere much better. So they can then categorize which ones are 
uh, at most or uh, pose the highest risk to humans. If we equip ourselves with the knowledge of what is out there, when a potential new virus does emerge, we'll be quickly able to identify where it came from and maybe even uh, prepare to have you know, a vaccine ready for it. Uh, in India, especially, humans have had a really long history of interaction with natural systems. And because of that, we've sort of, you know, co-evolved with some of these pathogens. And, we've, and, and indigenous people especially are actually immune to many of the viruses and pathogens that are found in these areas. When we talk about domestic animals and our relationship with domestic animals, India has a huge diversity of native breeds. Okay? And we find that those native breeds, because they were bred in a certain environment, they actually have a lot of resistance to infections by the common pathogens found in that environment. Okay? It's only when we've gone into this like higher gear production system where we've brought in these uh, high yielding hybrids or we've uh, moved uh, animals around or from a system where they, um, you know, like for example, bringing in Holstein Friesian cows to India, they just simply not adapted to this environment. And so they become really susceptible to a lot of diseases and they have to then pump them up with antibiotics and so on. Um, any culture that has had a long history of association with the land also has, uh, I'm gonna use this term very loosely, also, also has an ecological memory of association with that landscape. Okay, and, and it's the disruption of those kinds of relationships that is also uh, putting us at greater and greater risk. For example, with this uh, Dibang project, uh, they wanted to clear uh, several hundred uh, hectares of forest and say, oh, we'll, we'll you know, do compensatory afforestation for this elsewhere. You can't recreate those ecosystems. You know, you, and by doing that, you're again, again, increasing the risk of all of these diseases um, emerging into, into humans. In terms, of, uh, in terms of information transfer, what is it that you feel we need to focus on in the kind of information transfer to help humans respond better to one, maybe prevent such uh, huge uh, you know, disease outbreaks as well as uh, respond to them in the case that there is a um, you know, pandemic, epidemic in the future, what, what preparedness do we need to really look at? And what is the kind of information we should be sending out about it? And thanks for asking that question. I mean, that's, that's really at the heart of what we need to be doing going forward. We really need to rethink our systems from, from top to bottom. So starting from the very top with the ministries uh, at, the, at the central level, uh, to the states and to the local district level authorities. We need to come up with um, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches to public health. Okay, so public health cannot be viewed only as doctors going out there and doing and, you know, giving medicines or diagnosing diseases. We need to think of it in a lot, you know, in a more holistic manner. So uh, we also have to think of our, uh, our interactions with the environment, our interactions with the animals around us. Uh, we need to really, really up, ramp up the scientific surveillance capability in our country, especially One Health surveillance. Uh, now One Health surveillance is required because when, you know, the, the simple philosophy of One Health is that uh, when you, if you, if you have a healthy environment, and healthy animals, then you'll also have healthy people. It has to be done. It has to be done in an open manner. Data sharing has to be uh, transparent. It has to be available to the public. You know, if 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 there's an outbreak at the local scale, then those the people living there should be the first people to know about it. But that information should immediately flow upwards to planners at state levels and at central levels. So, in terms of general public. Uh, the, the information transfer from like very often the scientific community and the lay people are really there's almost no connecting link between what's happening. So how what kind of social information, what kind of uh, better understanding in the lay people can there be created through this experience of COVID-19? So, you know, COVID-19 has taught us the importance of getting uh, 
uh, information out in a timely manner. One of the things that governments should do is to to take people into confidence, to be able to you know to put information out there. Uh, because if you don't put correct information out there, then the wrong kind of information will spread. And we need to almost have an army of of people going out there putting out the correct information. Um, we need we need to have more direct interaction between scientists, such as this forum, for example. I mean, knowledge is power. We we live in an information age, and when good information is not available, then the risk of fake news spreading becomes higher as well. Okay, so it's better that the government puts out good, factually correct, scientifically valid information. Otherwise, people start inventing their own facts. Uh, this whole idea of vaccinations now, everyone the vaccine is the biggest savior of the situation. What do you feel about vaccines? Do you think that it's important that humans become vaccine dependent or is it something that is a pharmaceutical conspiracy theory that one hears about? What are your views on this? Um, no, I mean, look, we're already vaccine dependent. Uh, the great strides that have been made in human well-being and human health, greater longevity, all of these are attributed to vaccines. Our children, you know, are not dying uh, at young age from easily preventable diseases. You know, we have eradicated smallpox because of vaccines. We have uh, almost eradicated polio across the world because of vaccines. Uh, to me, uh, to me, anyone who's a vaccine skeptic or an anti-vaxxer, I have just one word to say to them, rabies. Okay, If you get exposed to rabies, the only way you can prevent it is through getting the vaccine on time. Okay, There is no cure for it. It is 100% fatal. Okay, so the idea that you know we shouldn't use all tools available to us uh, is is kind of to me that's kind of self-defeating, because because they have made human uh, human life better. They have increased longevity. Uh, so vaccines definitely are are the way to go. I do hope that very quickly we can come up with a vaccine for COVID-19, um, so that you know, people can go back out to, uh, you know, uh, the new normal. So uh, just this other thing about uh, vaccine versus immunity, like building immunity in humans, you know, the uh, general idea of healthier living, uh, better, uh, you know, immunity, diets, all of that, that versus a vaccine dependent, uh, of course, as you're saying, vaccines are very important when it comes to a direct exposure to a particular disease or preventing something that you know is on its way. But by and large, as human society, do you feel building immunity is a very important part of health and part of the natural system that you would advocate? Look, uh, you know, building immunity to diseases that you can build immunity to is very important. Okay, so there are some things that, you know, for example, as children, we were exposed to chickenpox and most of us are immune to that. Okay, uh, but you don't build immunity rabies, for instance. Okay, uh, you will very likely die from Ebola if you contracted it. You know, the mortality rates for some of these pathogens is really, really high. And there's very little chance that you will survive the attack of that virus to be able to build sufficient immunity. Uh, building immunity to some of the common uh, ailments that we suffer from, you know, the cold and the flu and those kinds of things. Is, is in general a good idea. Yes, we should have better, we should live healthier lifestyles, uh, but there are some pathogens that you often can't build an immunity to because of their virulence. Uh, now, you know, this is a time when young people are confronted with uh, um, multiple challenges, multiple reorientation, rethinking. What would be a key message that uh, you would like to leave with the young people who are responding to this time? So you know, my one the one thing that I've learned is that um, the 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 time of the lone hero, the lone warrior, is gone. Okay, uh, we need to be working together to solve problems, societal problems, uh, no matter what they are, no matter in which field. Okay, we need to have a diverse set of uh, expertise coming together to look at this thing, look at this problem and uh, look at any problem from different angles, okay, to understand it first properly. 
to understand the many outcomes or the many different pathways that uh, that this problem could go down. My real, my one sort of big uh, advice to to youngsters or to anybody is to work in teams. Okay, is to collaborate, to work with different people, because only if you do that will you come up with with solutions that will actually have lasting effect. You know, for for people in the northeast region, in particular, um, the development model that is being foisted upon the northeast region is an alien one. Now, the northeast region is a biodiversity hotspot, and you need to work in ways that will preserve that and showcase that. And that's where the economic development should come through preserving that biodiversity. It's an area of very high endemism, which means that the species that are found there are found nowhere else in the world. And if they're gone from there, then they're gone forever. Okay, extinction, done. Uh, so the idea that, you know, we could, uh, we, can, we can drown out the forest or we can have a large power plant or a coal mine or whatever in some of these areas, this is, it sounds so ridiculous and bizarre. And, you know, in a hundred years from now, people will be wondering what were those people thinking? Uh, and not just preserve the places, but preserve the, the really intricate relationship that the people of that region have with those systems. And the people of that region have been their biggest guardians. Uh, the youth of who are from that region have the largest role to play. Again, it's not just it's not just the place, it's not just the forests, but it's also the people that live in these forests. That lived experience has to also be preserved. That's absolutely great. Thank you so much, Abhi. Thank you. That's a lot of wisdom and a lot of understanding. And thank you for really bringing science to us. Thanks a lot, Abhi. Thank you. It's been my pleasure interacting with you. I look forward to actually meeting some of you soon.